Thank you for joining us today. I pray that our time together will help you experience Jesus and to share His grace. Today we're continuing our Fighting with Faith series. Today we're going to be looking at how to overcome anxiety and stress. So please turn in your Bible to Philippians chapter 4 as we will unpack this scripture together. Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 4 through 9. So go ahead and be turning in your Bible or devices to Philippians 4. I want you to know about a guy who I met several years ago when I first started preaching, and his name is Earl. That's right, Earl. I remember the first time I met Earl. He had this little button on his tie, and it had this big smiley face, and it said, Too blessed to be stressed. Now, if you knew Earl, you would know that that button really matched his life. He was always around with a smiling face. He was always singing. And despite a lot of difficult problems that he had going on in his life, he lived out the motto, he was too blessed to be stressed. Now, one day I got Earl to the side, I think it was at lunch together, and I said, Earl, please tell me your secret. Because when I get pushed down with life and when things just don't go my way, I easily become stressed. And I know that I'm blessed, but the stress just still eats at me. And he said, Joe, well, it kind of starts back in, I think it was 1988, he said. He had was raised in the church, and yet he walked away from the Lord, and he found himself one day in, a, in the, an operating room. He was having heart surgery. And he prayed out to God, saying, God, please help me during this time of surgery. And as he's praying to God right there in the OR, it hit him that he had not been living for Jesus. And he said, Lord, why, why is it that you should hear my prayer when I've been ignoring you for so long? He had a change of heart right then and there, and he cried out to God a second time, saying, Lord, forgive me. Help me to be more like Jesus. And after his heart operation, things for him changed. He looked at life with a brand new perspective, that he was saved by the grace of God, and that he dedicated his life to God once again. And he recognized, despite whatever bad things came his way, that he had someone who loved him and cared for him and had forgiven him of his years of unfaithful living. So he carried that sense of freedom with him wherever he went, that he recognized that he was too blessed to be stressed. And one day I hope that I will grow up and be like Earl. I hope that one day I'll be able to find the, the, the peace in my heart to, to be able to smile whatever comes my way. But you know what? Until that time, I'm still wrestling, I'm still fighting to know exactly how it is that I can live in the love of Jesus and how that I can find peace amidst the hurrisome pace of life and the stress that is always waiting for me around the corner. And I think that Paul, of all people, Paul knew stress, Paul knew anxiety, Paul knew worry. And so he's writing the book of Philippians within the prison. He's writing to a church that's having some problems, and he's, he's, he's close to them. He, he helped woo them into the faith, and he spent a lot of time with them. And yet now he's separated from them. He's in a prison, probably in Rome, and he's wanting to encourage them in the midst of his agony and isolation, anxiety, and worry. He writes a letter called the Letter to the Philippians. And then in chapter 4, we see this beautiful, beautiful exhortation and recommendation for the people there in Philippi. Let's read Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4 and going to verse 9. Hear the word of the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. 
Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Now, I love the fact that Paul is writing this amazing exhortation about rejoicing and, and not worrying in the midst of being in prison. Now, this is not county jail. This is not where he can watch um, cable television and have three meals provided. This is a Roman jail where if he had food, it was because somebody brought it. If he had comfort, it's because somebody brought it. If he had visitors, it was lucky. And so he is, he is sitting in this prison and he is just thinking about how he can encourage this church who is struggling without his presence. And so what I think we need to do is as we face different stress in our life, and I know that you have stress and anxiety and worry, I, I know that we all have life that burdens us down. What are some things that we can do to fight that anxiety, to fight that stress with our faith? How can we strengthen our faith so that we can fight the stress that's going on in our life? First off, what we see in verse 4 of Philippians 4 is rejoicing. We see that Paul is encouraging us to praise. Praise. What are you thinking, Paul? In the midst of, of prison, you're thinking about singing. In, in, the, in the midst of problems, you're wanting, you're wanting us to praise. Are you, are you crazy, Paul? I mean, he says, in whatever situation you can find, sing. Praise God in the midst of that situation. And the question I have is, Paul, how is it in the midst of the burden and pain and anguish that I have, how can I praise God? When I feel that God is so far away, how can I praise Him? Paul gives us the reminder of why we can praise God. And it's as simple as this. The Lord is near. In those midst of pain and worry and frustration, we often find ourselves feeling alone and we feel that God has abandoned us. What Paul is wanting us to recognize is that we can rejoice in the Lord because in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our anxiety, the Lord has not left us alone. A smoldering wick He will not snuff out. A bruised reed He will not break. That the Lord is near. There's a song, and it's, it's called Raise a Hallelujah. I don't know if you know this song, but the, the words go something like, I'll raise a hallelujah in the middle of the storm. Now, I think that's interesting that it's in the midst of the pain, it's in the midst of our crisis that we're willing to raise a hallelujah. And if you have never really thought about it, hallelujah just means praise to God. And, and do you know those people that whenever something goes wrong, you know, I would be saying some choice words, but yet they are the ones who are singing hallelujah Jesus. It's as if they're just praying Jesus and they're praying hallelujah. In the midst of their pain, they, 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 they're just saying hallelujah. And that they're willing to praise God in those midst of that pain, in the midst of that er, the worry, in the midst of that angst. That they, they, just, they sing songs of praise to God because they know that God is with them. The kind of songs that I like to sing when I'm in the midst of worry and anxiety are, Nobody knows the trouble I see. Yet, we recognize through the Psalms, the songbook of, of the early church, the songbook of Israel, that God knows our heartache. God knows our anxiety. And, and, and so the power is that Paul in prison is asking us to praise God in the midst of our storms and, and just sing out to Him, even if we don't feel it, even if we don't see it, to, to go ahead and to surrender it in praise. And I think the audacity that Paul says, if you're feeling bad, if you're feeling worried, you're feeling overwhelmed, sing praises. And I want to say, Paul, what gives you the right to give me such a hard recommendation? And then I'm reminded that before this letter was written, when Paul was in Philippi and he was ministering there, he was thrown into prison. Him and Silas were there. And around midnight, they felt so blessed to suffer for the cause of Christ that they began to sing. They praised God in the middle of their prison cell. 
They raised a hallelujah in the middle of the storm, and what God did was nothing short of a miracle when He opened up the doors and the shackles fell. God is waiting to do a miracle in your life when you turn over those times of worry and stress and anxiety and you turn it to praise. He's wanting to break the shackles of loneliness and isolation off of your hands. He's wanting to break that sense of worry and, and, and take it off of your back. God says, if you will praise me in whatever circumstance, in every circumstance, you will find peace in God. I think it's interesting that the people reading this letter, knowing that Paul is in prison, they remember when he was in prison in Philippi, and they hear the words rejoice. They're going to remember the story of him and Silas, and how the praise of the Lord broke the chains that were holding the apostle captive. Maybe God is waiting to break some chains in your life. If you would just surrender your worry to praise. The second thing that we see from Paul here after praise is that in verse 6 he says, Do not worry about anything. That's easy for you to say, Paul. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. I have to confess this. I grew up living in a culture of worry. As a first grader, I was so plagued with worry that my first grade teacher had to write me a note saying, Joe, you're a sweet kid, but you need to learn how to let go of worry and live a good life. I still remember that from first grade. I was so good at anxiety and worry that I had to be, uh, had to have an intervention in first grade about my life of worry. And what Paul says, he says, in addition to praise, if you're wanting to defeat the worry and anxiety and stress in your life, you have to pray. It says, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. So here you have this supplication, you're, you're, you're crying out to God, you're, you're asking God to help other people, and, and you're praying to God in prayers of gratitude. These are the prayers, and we let our requests be known to God. Let Him know what we're struggling with. God knows what we need, and God knows we need to let go of control of our lives and surrender in prayer. I mean, it, it's amazing that in prayer we do surrender control. Even Jesus says, not my will, but thy will be done. We need to recognize that God is a good Father. If, if me being not perfect, I am not the perfect person, I am not the perfect preacher, I am not the perfect parent, but if my kid asks me, Dad, can I have some bread? Can I have some water? I know how to give good things to my children. How much more is God going to meet my needs when I let my requests be known unto God? Now, the problem is, a lot of times, we will pray for something. We'll say, Lord, intervene in this. And then we don't give Him control over that situation. We want to continue to, to meditate on it, worry about it. We've prayed about it, but we've not let it go in our heart. And, and I, I don't know about you, but, you know, it's hard for me to let go and give it to God sometimes. And it's kind of silly because, you know, if there's something going on with my dishwasher, I'm going to try to fix it myself, but ultimately, I'm not a handyman. And so what I will find out is, I can't fix it. And so I will call a repairman, and I will say, here, you fix it. And as they're working on it, you know what I do? I leave the room. I trust him to take care of it. I leave it in his capable hands. I don't sit there watching every move that he makes and saying, uh, are you sure you need to use it? Don't you need to use another tool? Don't you, don't you need it to replace that washer? Don't you need it? I can't tell the handyman to fix things that I know nothing of. I have to humble myself and let him take control and fix it. If I can do that with a handyman, 
Surely I can do that with God and say, God, I surrender control. I praise you for you, that you being good, and I'm just going to leave it in your hands, and I'm not going to try to control this problem anymore. Here's a little exercise. I want you to repeat after me. I am not the ruler of the universe. I surrender control to all my worries and give them to God. Doesn't that just free you up to, to recognize that you don't have to be in control of everything? that you can leave it in the hands of God, that you can praise God for His goodness, that you can pray to Him to take control and surrender that and give it to Him and let Him fix it. Finally, Paul gives us something else in verse 8. He says, Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, what is just, pure, pleasing, commendable, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Paul says, I want you to praise, I want you to pray, and I want you to ponder. Now, Paul knows the nature of humans, that we're going to think about things, and we're going we're to wrestle with things, and we're going to meditate on things. And he says, if, if you're going to ponder about things, if you're going to continue to run things over in your mind, he says, don't focus on your worries and your weaknesses. Focus on the glory of God. Focus on the good things. Focus on gratitude. Ponder these things. For these things are what you can think about after you've given control back to God. When you're not worrying about how things are going to go. When you've surrendered it to God, it frees up this space in your head, in your heart, and that you can think on good things. I don't know about you, but there are times that I'll wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning worried about the most random things. I'll worry about, oh no, I need to make sure to, to call the plumber because th that drain was sounding a little weird. Now, what can I do about that at 3 o'clock in the morning? Absolutely nothing. As I think about financial planning, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning, there's nothing that I can do. I can't call a broker. I can't call the bank. I can't, I can't do anything to go earn more money. I just have to stop worrying about it. Yes, I can make a plan, but then I have to just let it go and ponder good things. Someone has said that, that worry is like a rocking chair, that it will give you something to do, but it doesn't take you anywhere. By pondering these worthy things, whatever is true, pure, right, and just, these are the characteristics of God. When I ponder those, I want to praise Him. I want to pray to Him. I want to turn over more things into my life when I ponder the goodness and meditate on the Messiah. Paul wants us to ponder these things. Stop worrying about things you don't have control over and give control over to God. Ponder the goodness of God. Whatever is just, whatever is pure, set your mind, the Colossians writer says, on things above. You see, our mind has to be intentional about what we think about. And we have to train our minds to be subjected to the will of God. It starts with praise. It continues with prayer. It's lived out in what pondering. And finally, what we see in verse 9, that Paul gives us this, this power of faith. He says, verse 9, Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the peace of God will be with you. What, what is it, Paul, are you wanting to do? He says, I want you to praise. I want you to pray. I want you to ponder good things. And finally, I want you to persevere. Keep on doing what you have learned. Praise, pray, ponder. Keep on doing these things. Make this not just a, a quick trying of something, but a continual characteristic of your life that you're turning things over to God. Um, several years ago when I was preaching at another church, uh, there was this, this, this young man, uh, his name was Joe. 
Gotta love the name, right? But Joe was a lover of, of Motown music, and, and he was excited. And when you'd ask Joe, said, Joe, how's it going? And he would just, he would always just, um, he would sing this song, Keep On Pushing, uh, written by Curtis Mayfield, and it was sung by the Impressions. And you may not know this song, but whenever you'd say, hey, Joe, how you doing? He would sing a line, just say, gotta keep on pushing. And, and it always brought a smile to my face because even in the midst of whatever lows and, and struggles that he had, he recognized that God was in control and it was up to him just to keep on pushing through. Now, I want you to recognize that sometimes in the midst of worry and anxiety, you feel powerless and you don't feel like you have the strength to go much further. Perseverance is a gift that comes after you have already praised and prayed and pondered. Then you are able to have the strength, to have the power to persevere. Now, I don't want you to give up yet. I know that anxiety plagues us. We live in a world right now that is extremely stressed out, more so now than maybe ever before. But I want you to recognize that the peace of the Lord can be given to you by the grace of God. Now, I do want to take a minute before we depart, and, and I want you to know that there are, there are situations in life where anxiety and depression and worry and all these things, um, it's not just praying it away that there are times that you might need medical help through medication, through therapy, through whatever uh, diagnostics and, and pharmaceutical treatments that need to be dealt with. I, I, I don't want to lessen that. Um, God has given us medicine. God has given us medical professional to help us to be whole and live the life that we were created to live. And sometimes, because of the broken nature of creation, we need that extra uh, hormone or that extra uh, drug to help us to, to get back to where we need to belong. And we can praise God for that medication. We can praise God for those doctors. We can praise God for that therapy. And it doesn't make you any less of a Christian that you can have Jesus and a therapist too. I want you to understand that. That once you get to this point where that you can praise God, when you get to that point where you can pray and surrender, and you can ponder and put good things in your mind, and then you can persevere, and you can know the peace of God as a grace-given gift to you. Not because you've earned it, but because you have been given freely the amazing power of peace. Now, again, you can have Jesus and a therapist, but I want you to also focus on praise, even in the middle of the storm. I want you to pray. Even if you don't think you hear anything from God, pray anyway. And I want you to ponder the good things in life. Stop getting stuck in that cycle of negativity. Focus on what's true and just and good and worthy of your time. And in the midst of all that, keep on pushing. Persevere. And you will know that the God of peace is with you forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for these wise words from Paul that we can know your peace, experience your presence with us as we praise, as we pray, as we ponder, and as we persevere. Father, help us. Give us the strength. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Be blessed.